Jesus, all the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. To this I hold, to this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. When the race, when the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but to Christ in me. Yet not I, but to Christ in me. Yet not I, but to Christ. Slow, yeah. I think we can uh, a little bit too slow. Mm. Okay, I will. Uh, I will play slow. Yeah. Okay. okay. I will play a little bit faster. I will play faster. Yeah. Can you can you hear, uh, hear the piano? Okay, let's try a little bit faster, okay? What gave of grace There's Jesus my Redeemer There is no more For heaven now to give it is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to Him. Oh, how strange! And divine, I can see all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. You do, yeah? Like that? Yeah. A little bit faster? Okay. All right. Okay. I think when Good. the drums are in, it's picking up without the drum, it's kind of like. Let's write the first song, okay? I want. I sing, sing with energy, okay? All right. One, two, three, four. Come, people of the risen King, who delight to bring Him praise. Come, all and to your the morning star of grace. From the shifting shadows of the earth, we will live our lives to Where steady arms of mercy reach, we will gather Rejoice! 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 Let every tongue rejoice! Church of Christ Come those whose joy is morning sun And those sweeping through the night Come those who tell the battle sword And those struggling in the fire 
For his perfect love will never change, and his mercy never cease. I follow us through our days in the sermon. Rejoice! 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 Let every tongue rejoice. One heart, one voice. O Church of Christ, rejoice. Okay, thank you. That's good. All right. Um. Okay, let's sing uh, Oh Lord, My Rock and My Redeemer one more time, okay? okay. Oh Lord, My Rock and My Redeemer Greatest treasure of my longing soul Continue, continue, continue My God, like you there is no other True delight is found in you alone Your grace Your grace, a well to deep to fathom your love exceeds the heavens reach your truth i found a perfect wisdom my highest good and my unending oh, oh, oh. And my Redeemer, strong defender of my weary heart, my sword to fight the cruel deceiver, and my shield against the sinful dark. My song, my song, when, when enemies surround me. My hope when, when times of sorrow rise, my joy when, when trials are abounding, your faithfulness, my refuge in the night. Okay, good, thank you. My microphone is kind of like too low. I mean, can you? Bring up the high frequency yes, in my. Yes. It's very like heavy. My microphones. No treble at all. Can you bring up the the higher frequency? Hello. Yes. I. Okay. Let me sing. Okay. Oh. Oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Greatest treasure of my longing soul My God, like you there is no other Okay True delight is found in you alone Your grace Okay, I think It's okay Thank you
Good morning, church. Why don't we all find our seats and settle down and quiet our hearts. Welcome everyone to SCBC Walnut. This is the English service here and uh, we are glad to be here to worship with you all. We are, uh, we are thankful for every single person here. Uh, for whether you're attending here in person, whether you're out in the lobby or in the cry room, whether you're watching us on, through the live stream, uh, we appreciate all of us here together that we get to come together as a body and to worship our God, our Lord and Savior. And so to, to start us off, I just want to go ahead and encourage us from, uh, from Paul's, the Apostle Paul's, his prayer to the Thessalonians, found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And here he encourages Thessalonians who, were ex who had exemplary faith and love, right? And yet, even though they had exemplary faith and love, Paul encourages them to continue to abound more so, to continue to grow, that the work is not done. And here's what he says. Now, may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Let's pray. Father, we come to you, Lord, we are so thankful, God. We are thankful, Lord, that you pursue us, that, Lord, you care about us, that, Lord, that you would use the church, that each one of us here are here to build each other up, to equip one another, to encourage one another, so that, Father, we can abound more and more so in love for one another. May we do this, Lord, well. May we continue to live out this church life well. May we continue to be a spiritual family for one another and continue to encourage and continue to support one another in a way that keeps us blameless and pure so that your witness, Lord, your gospel will not be tainted. And so, Father, may all glory then go to you, and may we then sing with joy and continue to live our lives out with reverence to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Would you please rise? And uh, before we sing, would you please greet each other in front of you, next to you, behind you, say hi, good morning, shake your hands. You can hug them if you want. <laughs> All right, let's worship together. Let's sing, come people of the recent king. Put your hand together. Come be the love the risen King who delight to bring you praise. Come on and tune your hearts to sing to the morning star. When the shifting shadows of the earth, we will lift our eyes to Him. There stay the arms of mercy reach together, children. Everybody sing! Rejoice! Rejoice! Let every tongue rejoice! One heart, one voice, O Church of Christ, rejoice! Come those whose joy is morning sun, and those weeping through the night. Come those who tell the battles won, and those struggling in the night. For His perfect love will never change, for His mercies never cease. But follow us through all our days with the certain hope. Rejoice! Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice. One heart, one voice, O church 
Short to show, we hear them call. That truth that rise through every inch, our God is all in all. Everybody, rejoice, rejoice. Let every tongue rejoice. One heart, one voice. To church of Christ, we rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice, one heart, one voice, O Church of Christ, rejoice. Praise the Lord. Let's sing together. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. My holy trust in Jesus' name. Every voice. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. My holy trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak, made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of Darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every heart, a stormy gale. My anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within. When he shall come 
with trumpet sound Oh may I then in Him be found Dressed in His righteousness alone Faultless stand before the throne Christ Christ alone, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of Thank you. 
Good morning, church. Welcome again, everyone, to SBC WANA here in our English service. My name is Gabe. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm going to walk us through some announcements. So if you have either your program or you can go and scan the digital code behind me, uh, and just take a look at me as, as, I as I highlight a few announcements. Uh, first of all, if you're new here with us or if you have been part of our family here and, and you haven't, and you want to know how to take your next step to be part of a group, to be part of a community, uh, to be invested into the church family, I encourage you to, to walk out of doors and visit our Next Steps table. Uh, they are the table when you walk out to the lobby to your left. Uh, talk with them. They'll, they'll love to be able to walk with you and to, and to see where we, we can plug you into community. Um, and so this month is indeed open enrollment month, uh, month of April. Um, so you're not part of any groups, any small groups or community groups, uh, please go visit them they'll, and they'll, they'll let you know which groups will best fit and match what you're looking for in terms of, in terms of community here. Um, and you can also sign up through uh, the links that we have as well um, with the QR codes there. A uh, second announcement that I just want to give a quick update for is that for our Annie Armstrong Easter update, we are still collecting this offering until the end of April. Uh, thus far, we have collected about $41,000, and our goal is to hit 70 k um, And so if you are still looking, still praying about giving to this offering, uh, it is open until the end of April. Uh, next, I want to highlight announcement number three, which is about VBS this summer. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone who signed up to volunteer to help with VBS this summer. Uh, thank you for just being part of this great ministry, uh, for us to be able to reach the community, for us to be able to disciple our children. Um, and so if you signed up to help with VBS, uh, thank you for volunteering. Uh, we have closed the registration for volunteers, but right now official VBS registration for the children and also for the, uh, the parent program, that's open right now. And so if you have young kids you, uh, or if you have young families that you want to invite to our VBS, um, perhaps your neighbors or some family friends who do not know Christ, who are not part of a church, we will love to engage with them. And so go and let them know the code, let them know that we can sign up um, and, and and yeah, and all the information is on there. Uh, you can also check out our website. You can find more information there. Um, and right now, we have an early bird price of $30. Early bird price of $30. And so come join us. Uh, again, well, I guess we, I've been saying VBS. We are calling it summer camp just so that it's more uh, friendly and understandable to what this is. But we are still unashamedly knowing that this is indeed a Christian thing we're doing. We are going to bring the Bible to them. Uh, but yeah, we, you can use the word summer camp instead if you're if you want to invite your unbelieving friends. Um, so again, that's on that's, that's this summer from June 24th, 28th. Um, and so we'll continue to have uh, signups open for that. Uh, next, uh, I want to highlight announcement number five in announcements. Uh, the Duos Ministry, which is our young uh, singles ministry here that I personally am um, helping lead. Uh, we have our Young Singles Hub next Saturday. 
Uh, so if you're here with us and, and you consider yourself a young single person, meaning you're not married, so you can be, you can be dating, you can be engaged, um, and you want to come out uh, to this hub where you're able to connect with other young singles within our church, uh, to sign up for this hub for next Saturday, the deadline is today. The deadline is today. Um, and so please go and sign up. The, the, the QR code will lead you to the form, or you can always go to our website and underneath workshops, ministries and workshops, uh, you'll be able to find the sign up form there as well. All right, uh, there, is a, there is an optional cost of $12 that's mainly for a catered lunch uh, to join us for a lunch fellowship afterwards. So again, that's uh, that the Sing Young Singles Hub next Saturday, April 20th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, that will be held in the Prey Center in the PC over there in that building over there. All right, so please RGP by today. All right, next, uh, number six, next week as well, we also have a spring training for children's ministry. Um, and so that's happening after service, after Sunday service from 1245 to 30. And so if you're interested in uh, serving with the children, well, whether that's Awana or Children's Sunday School, uh, please come out to this training. Um, and if you need more information, uh, you can go online, find more information, as well as contacting our sister Katie, uh, who, who oversees the children ministry here. Uh, lastly, just quick, I uh, just want to put it on your calendars, is that the women community will have their next event on May 4th. Um, and so on, in May 4th, uh, they'll do another walk. Um, and so join them and walk and talk and uh, enjoy life with one another. With that, uh, let me go ahead and lead us through prayer, and then we'll have one more song after the prayer, and then we'll hear the word of God being brought to us. So join with me in prayer. Lord, um, Father, we have indeed uh, a busy church where there's a lot of things coming up. And not even, I mean, everything I just highlighted is just one small aspect of our church. We have ongoing ministries. We have uh, short-term mission trips coming up. Uh, we, 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 there, there, there's all these different things and activities happening with our church um, that, Lord, uh, sometimes we can get caught up with the calendar. And, and I just pray right now that at least here in this time, and, and just, it, even if we don't have time, space and time to, to come near to you, at least here right now, in this service, that, Lord, may we quiet our hearts and put on, Lord, a spirit of learning. That, Lord, we may learn from you and learn from your word and continue to walk with you, God. And so I pray, Father, that for all of us here, that, Lord, as we, as we quiet our hearts before you, may it, may it reinforce the gospel and may it remind us, Lord, that we are your children. You care for us. And may it strengthen us, Lord, and, and to do your work. And so, Father, I pray then that for all of us here, that whatever, um, whatever busyness of life that we may be going through, that, God, we may find the time to spend with you, to remind ourselves, Father, that we are indeed your children, your disciples, and that, God, you care for us and you love us, and you, Lord, want to be with us. Um, and so, Father, thank you for all that you have given to us. Thank you, for Lord, for all the ministries that you've given to us. May we continue, Lord, to be prayerful in all these ministries, that we remember, we remember to pray constantly, not to serve and work, but to pray that, Lord, that Christ will indeed be present among us as we continue, Lord, to be your witnesses to this world. Um, so, Father, thank you again for your grace and your mercy. May we come to you now with a heart filled with joy to worship your name and to hear your word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you please rise again and let's sing, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Everybody sing. Your grace, a well too deep to fathom. Your love exceeds the heaven's reach. The truth 
have found a perfect wisdom, my highest good and my unending need. Oh, My song, my song, when, when enemies surround me, my hope, when times of sorrow rise, my joy, when trials are abounding, your faithfulness and refuge in the night. Have a seat. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's a joy to worship the Lord together. We're continuing our series through the epistle of 1 Timothy. And today we have one of those passages where we, do, we need to do a lot of teaching. And so please have your Bibles ready. Um, not every single verse that we reference will be on screen for you, but we'll have the main passage. Today's passage contains gold. Gold for Christians who are digging for answers. The answers to questions like, for good churches, how do you keep good pastors from leaving? We hear a lot about pastors being caught and um, guilty of spiritual abuse. But what we don't often hear about, but you're beginning to see come out, is pastor abuse, churches that abuse their pastors. And so there's more and more pastors joining the great resignation and leaving their pulpits for the secular desk. You also, if you talk to Christian colleges and seminaries, there's less young men going into full-time ministry that... You could serve the Lord as a layperson. You can serve the Lord bivocationally. And so we're facing also a crisis of less ministers preparing to go out into the field now compared to, let's just say, 10, 15 years ago. Does the Bible have anything to say about what healthy churches can do to encourage and keep good pastors? Is there anything the Word of God has to say, and the Word of God has a lot to say. And we're going to look at that this morning. But on the flip side, there's churches that abuse their pastors, and this is not one of those churches, by the way. 
But like I mentioned, all, it's, it's normal now for you to turn on the news or check your social media feed and to see once again another prominent celebrity pastor falling to moral failure, embezzlement, sexual immorality. Now there's largely the abuse of power. Does the Word of God have anything to say? What does the Word of God have to say to protect good churches from men and women who come in to the church, but they end up as wolves in sheep's clothing? Does the Word of God have anything to say? Does the Word of God have anything to say about men who start their ministries well and generally are good character pastors, but because of stress, uh, but, but because of unchecked blind spots, they have moments of failure, they're too afraid to say anything, it snowballs into a major black mark character issue, and all of a sudden, a good pastor turns into someone who is disqualified now. Is there anything the church could do to guard not only themselves from a bad pastor, but guard that pastor from heading down the wrong direction? Well, the Word of God has gold for us and answers, but it's in the form of instructions. Those instructions are in 1 Timothy 5, 17 to 25. These instructions give us the line, a trustworthy line between honoring a pastor and keeping that pastor accountable. This includes the pastor's protection. And so I've entitled our time today, The Trustworthy Line Between Honor and Accountability. Unlike some of the other passages, this passage talks about pastors, but it's actually directed towards you. These are Paul's instructions for believers, church members, as to how they are to relate to those who lead them. And so if you have God's word, meet me now in 1 Timothy chapter 5, and we'll start in verse 17. In verses 17 and 18, we see the first point, trustworthy honor. Trustworthy honor. Yes, it's big. Uh, we see one of the ma major themes, and I think it's the main theme uh, of 1 Timothy, is trustworthy. If anybody can afford to donate some swag, let's get some swag with, some, with trustworthy on it in, in some cool font, some hats and some t-shirts. I think that would be pretty trustworthy, and it'd be, it, it, would be, it would be cool, but um, we don't have, we're not going to put that into our budget. So if someone wants to do that and donate it to us, everybody can wear trustworthy clothing. But, <laughs> and you'll know that you go to FCBC, and hopefully you are trustworthy in how you live, and, and you'll be convicted. And people will say, are you really trustworthy in, in representing Jesus Christ? And it'll be a great challenge for you to put that shirt on each and every day. So if anybody wants to make a donation after Annie Armstrong, <laughs> you can do that, all right? Um, with that, trustworthy honor. All right, let's look at verses 17 to 18. Here's what the Apostle Paul instructs to the church now. He says, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Now, these two verses are primarily about the compensation of pastors. So in verse 17, we see once again a reference to elders. This word elder, just like you would, you would see in any, uh, any institution, any village, any, anything during the ancient times, elders were the leaders. Now, typically in religious est establishments of those times, you're looking at older men. Those were the elders. They just happen to be older, more wisdom. But we know that when, when Paul writes to Timothy and when he talks about elders, he uses this word interchangeably with overseers. 1 Timothy 3, he gives qualifications for overseers. In Titus chapter 1, he gives the same qualifications. He uses the term elder. In Acts chapter 20, he, he actually meets with the elders in Ephesians of, of the church of Ephesus, and they are referred to as elders. There's another word that's used interchangeably, but more referring to what an elder or overseer does. It's the word that where it comes from shepherd, but we use the title pastor. So in the New Testament, you have pastor, 
overseer, elder, used interchangeably in the New Testament. And so when you see elder, it's not necessarily someone who's older, but someone who's spiritually mature. Timothy was in his 30s. He was young in comparison to what, would, what a religious elder would, would have been, uh, but he had the spiritual maturity. Thus, Paul charged him to exercise all of the responsibility and not to shy away, shy away from eldering. Right? So the reference to elders, it's elders, overseer, pastor, in, in a Baptist church setting where we don't typically use the term elder, we're going to refer to this as pastor. So he's talking about pastors. Now, a few weeks ago, a, a few weeks ago, uh, we looked in 1 Timothy chapter 4 where it says, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. So this is an encouragement for churches to have a plurality of elders. Notice that elders, plurality, and among that plurality, there would be younger elders gleaning wisdom from older elders or pastors working together, right? And his instructions is double honor should be shown to those who rule well. Now that's convicting because he adds that qualifier, meaning there are elders who are ruling, but not all elders, not all pastors rule well. Now this is especially relevant in the church of Ephesus because nowhere does it say that all of the elders are bad or evil. In fact, many of the elders we assume are faithful and they're not among the false teachers. But there was clearly a leadership crisis where young Timothy was sent there and he had to raise up elders and overseers. He had to get some of the overseers there to actually lead well. You see, this word rule, it's not ruling like a king rules, but it does mean to provide spiritual oversight. Ruling here refers to directing the ministries of the church. Some of your Bible translations might say direct the affairs of the church. Those are some of the older, more contemporary translations, right? Direct the affairs of the church. That's what it means. It's the idea of managing a the household of God. Uh, an elder, an overseer, a pastor needed to be qualified to first manage their own household. Otherwise, how could they manage the household of God? That's what it means to rule well. And to rule well, you see good leadership is really revealed during times of crisis. That's when you see. When there's conflict in the church, when there's church discipline that needs to be exercised, when the church is going through hard times, that's when the elders and the pastors who rule well stand out from the rest. And so Paul is not saying to honor every single pastor, but he's saying those who rule well, and that's convicting for me, do we lead well? Pastoring is not just preaching and teaching. It's not just counseling, but do you lead well in your counseling, in your preaching and teaching? And the other thing that we need to remember that every elder Every pastor, every overseer must be able to teach because the primary way a pastor rules or leads is through preaching and teaching God's word. Uh, you don't rule through your own opinion or through your own ideas or simply just, this is my own vision that comes out of nowhere, right? It comes out of my own thoughts and my own reflections. A pastor's authority stands or falls with his interpretation and his teaching and preaching of scripture. A pastor's rule comes from God's rule. A pastor represents God. In this passage, it's not, the pastor is not responsible to the congregation. He is, but really, when you look at the pastor's responsibility, he has to answer to God. And, and that's the greater judgment. I, I was listening to a sermon um, talking about overseers and pastors from one prominent pastor. I don't name them anymore because you never know when they'll be, uh, you know, <laughs> disqualified. You're like, oh man, I thought that guy was solid, you know. And so one pastor, and, and, and he was saying how some of you, um, you pass an exam and then you go into your career. You've passed the bar, you've passed it, you've passed your, 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 your licensing, maybe you have to do it over again, but once you pass the examination, you do your work. For a pastor, as you do your work, you are being examined. And you don't pass your examination until you face the Lord. That's clear from 1 Corinthians. That Paul says that on the day of the Lord, when you go before the Lord, the Lord will reveal whether your, your work will burn or whether it will be like gold or silver. Right? So a pastor is constantly being examined in his work 
and he will ultimately face the judgment of God. And so ruling well is, is really what motivates a pastor to rule well is that he has to answer to God. So ruling well refers to good leadership. It refers to good and healthy pastors who not only maintain the qualifications for the office, but they also lead the church. They shepherd well. Now, 1 Timothy 3, like I mentioned, mentioned that every pastor must be able to teach. And I, I mentioned once again that this is, whenever you see elders used, it's never elder. It's always elders, established elders, the overseers. Philippians 1.1, Paul greets the overseers and the deacons. It's, there's a plurality of pastors. It's always not one man. It's not one celebrity pastor. It's not a single senior pastor that rules. rules. No, I get it that in certain smaller churches, they can only afford one senior pastor. And so then there's volunteers and deacons that kind of lead together. Uh, but the, the idea and the intention was all, always the church is led and governed by a plurality of pastors. Pastors who you will see later who are ordained for full-time ministry. Now, the word honor means primarily financial remuneration. That's a fancy word. The commentaries keep using that word. I'm like, I, we don't use that word. We use compensation, payment. Fair, just payment for a pastor. So uh, I don't think this passage is talking about the distinction between a lay pastor versus a, a paid pastor. I don't think it's talking about ruling pastors versus uh, teaching pastors. This is clearly talking about uh, honoring those who needed full-time vocational payment for their ministry. Because a lay pastor... A tent, a tent maker like Paul raised his own funds, even though he was, he was worthy of receiving payment, right? And, and so that's the idea. And, and I want you to see this clearly because the way that Paul uses honor needs to be used in context. Earlier and last week, Pastor Gabe did a wonderful job, just an amazing job preaching on the passage of honoring widows. And what was the honor? For those who are truly widowed, which means they had no family to take care of them, truly widowed, the church was to provide what type of support? Financial support. In the same context, when it talks about double honor, it's talking about paying for pastors who labor. Now, this word labor, I'm not going to get into it too much because it's too many passages. But in 2 Timothy, it talks about laboring in the reference of like a farmer who works hard. Paul talks about his own labor, and, and it's going to be judged by God. I mentioned the 1 Corinthians passage. There's other places where this word labor is not easy. It, it's hard work to labor in preaching and teaching, so much so that you don't have time to take up a, a side job, a secular job, that you have to give your full-time work, your working hours, to ministry. It is those pastors who are worthy of compensation because they can't pay for themselves. You, you're gonna, they can't make a living otherwise, right? And you're going to see that everything in these two verses is talking about financial payment. That, that this, is, this is what it's talking about. So um, my Presbyterian brothers, who I love, and, and I think it's okay if you look at it this way, they look at uh, two, two categories of pastors or elders that, that, that uh, I've mentioned before. They look at ruling elders. Ruling elders are, are volunteers. These are lay elders, non-paid. They have a secular job or, or another job or a paraministry job that pays them, and, and that's how they make their living. And they sit on a, a leadership team of the church where they volunteer their time. They're able to teach, but they might not participate in regular preaching and teaching. It takes too much time, but they give spiritual insight. They are spiritually mature men who have an outside job, and they're lay elders. We call them ruling elders. They participate in directing the ministry of the church, and then there's teaching elders in the Presbyterian church, and these are the ordained pastors who are paid by the church, full-time pastors. And so they see this distinction. Uh, here, they, they take the word especially, those who labor are preaching and teaching, those are the ones you pay. But it's clearly saying double honor for all elders. So I don't think that's the Baptist interpretation. But again, there's nothing wrong with that. But I don't think Paul here, like I said, is making that distinction. Not to say that that distinction can't be made, but I don't think that distinction is being made from this 
passage. He's not uh, making a distinction between ruling elders and teaching elders. He's not making a distinction between greater elders and lesser elders. One prominent pastor, lo- locally located, one of my favorite pastors, actually said, pastors who preach better, they're more gifted. Is, that's what it's saying, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. There are certain pastors, all pastors need to be able to teach, but there's some who preach better. They deserve more pay. Right? I mean, it's, it's, I'm like, well, not everybody's like you, you know, that's that good, right? And so this is actually a celebrity pastor who uh, preaches really well, one, one of my favorite pastors, and in his commentary, he mentions that. And so I don't think that it's talking about greater elders versus lesser elders. It says, let the elders who rule well. So all of them, whether they, they, they preach all the time or whether they, they simply counsel people with God's word, but they're spiritually mature, let them all be worthy of double honor. So, and I don't think he's making a distinction between lay pastors versus paid pastors. It's not wrong to have lay pastors, uh, but I don't think he's making a distinction. What he's saying is that there's certain people who would not be able to survive if they weren't compensated. And that's how you can honor them, right? And so uh, let's get into that. And we see that in verse 18. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the labor, laborer deserves his wages. Now there's something beautiful about here. The, this is a, a citation of two scriptural passages. The first is the Old Testament passage in Deuteronomy 25, verse 4, where it talks about muzzling an ox. But the second is really encouraging. Because at this point, and I've mentioned this before, the New Testament is not yet completed yet. You don't have this 66-book canon of Scripture that you're holding in his hands. Where he talks about the laborers deserve their wages, you know whose mouth those words came out of? Take a guess. Jesus, right? That's the one Sunday school answer that's never wrong in church, especially a Baptist church. Jesus. And so Paul is referring to Luke chapter 9, verse 7 primarily, and then used in a, in a different way in Matthew 10, 10. So very early on, he's referring to Matthew and Luke as scripture. That is amazing. It's like Luke's still alive. You remember, Luke himself was not an apostle. Luke was not one of the original disciples. Matthew was, yet Paul says, Luke, his words are scripture. I don't know how they figured it out among each other, but there was a conversation happening as to which letters, which documents written were authoritative and divinely inspired. We can have confidence in the scriptures as Paul himself had confidence. I wonder if Paul knew that his own writings were scripture. I mean, that's kind of like, oh, I'm writing the word of God. But the Holy Spirit revealed it to him. And so that's wonderful. So he refers to Luke chapter 9 and Matthew 10 as scripture. Now, this ox illustration I think is pretty funny. Just imagine an ox with a muzzle over their mouth, the the COVID ox, you know, uh, wearing the mask. But um, it's not referring to that, right? It's referring to, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament had gracious provision for animals. This is so interesting that in the Old Testament law, in Deuteronomy 25, verse 4, it was really to ensure common sense farming wisdom. You see, the oxen, I'm not going to try to be an oxen right now, right? But the oxen (laughs) would thresh the floor, the threshing floor, they would thresh the grains. And you're an oxen, so as you're threshing the grain... Okay, you're going to eat some of the grain. Now, what's the Chinese farmer going to do? Muzzle the ox. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right? What, you know, there, there were some farmers who were greedy. They're like, we're losing profit here. You can't have the worker eating the product. <laughs> right? But that's just, you know, the, the ox is going to get frustrated. The ox is working hard, getting hungry, uh, and you got a muzzle over his mouth. He's trying to you know, get into the grains, he's getting frustrated, it's counterproductive. And so the Old Testament, the scriptures actually said, don't be foolish. This ox is working hard. Let him participate or, or let the oxen participate and eat off the fruit of some of its labor. Let it eat some of its grains. That's the picture there. 
And Paul uses it several times to say, if God cared to provide for the oxen that's threshing the, the grain, that, that's for our physical feeding, right? The grains turn into our physical food. What about those who provide for our spiritual feeding? Don't muzzle the ox. Allow the pastor who gives his full-time vocational focus to preparing and teaching and, and ministering God's word and leading the church with God's word, allow them to partake in the fruit of their ministry by providing for them fair compensation. That's, that's what it's saying. Don't muzzle the ox. Don't cause the pastor to not be able to do their ministry because they're worried about their finances and have to find different ways to make a living and to provide for themselves and their families, right? And so that's the first part. Don't muzzle the ox, right? But secondly, when it says the laborers uh, deserve their wages, this is taken from Luke chapter 9 and Matthew 10, as I mentioned. Remember Jesus he sent out how many, to, how many um, disciples? Not just 12, but there were, some of you Bibles, so 72. Remember that? How many of you guys remember that? He sent out the 72, and he told them, don't take anything with you. Don't bring a bag of money. Don't bring any provisions, because God will provide for them. Because when you go into the town, allow those you minister to, if someone invites you into their home, stay in that home, allow them to feed you, and then he uses the term, because the laborers deserve their wages. That's what Jesus said. And so, so these two ideas from the scriptures put together make for the foundation of why there's such a thing as full-time ministry. Now, I said, I said a lot about that, but, but these two verses were actually the hardest verses. Did you know that? It took a long time to try to figure out that, and, and there's so many different views, and I hope that was clear to you. So if you have a different view, I respect your view, but that's how I feel we should take it, okay? So we honor good pastors through appropriate honor, through fair wages. Uh, now, there's a trustworthy line between honoring pastors and keeping them accountable. Pastors are also members of the church. They're gifted. Uh, their gifts and their office does not elevate them to a position above all. Okay, so double honor means first they have the honor of the office. That's the honor of being able to come before God, but then the second honor is, is to be paid for your work is such an honor. And this honor is given voluntarily by the church. Pastors must lead and preach well. If you don't lead well and if you don't have people who want to sit under you or be part of your parish or your church, if you have no parishioners, you're, you're a pastor of nobody, right? So there's a fine line between honor, which is bestowed upon a pastor, and accountability. Pastors are members of the church. We also need to be kept accountable. Now, that doesn't mean that you judge and cancel the pastors. We're human beings. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to say things, and uh, we're going to have days where you see us frustrated, right? And um, we just have to be honest. We have to fight hard to try to be above reproach. But the scriptures provide for protection and correction. It's both. I want you to see what I'm going to read to you, not as the punishment of pastors, but the protection of pastors. And the second part is the correction of pastors who don't want the protection. They need to be disciplined, okay? So let me read to you. Point number two is the trustworthy protection and correction, verses 19 and 21. It says in verse 19, do not omit a charge against an elder, let's say pastor, except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Verse 20, as for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. This sounds a lot like Matthew 18. Verse 21 in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels. That's not talking about Calvinistic angels. Okay, I'll explain that in a minute. Okay. I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. In other words, it doesn't matter if you have a celebrity pastor that brings in all your income and everything like that. If they're sinful, you've got to discipline them all right, if they persist in sin. Well, there's a lot to unpack here. Let's get to it. Verse 19 Verse 19 is aligned with Jesus' instructions for church discipline found in Matthew 18. So we're talking about serious accusations, right? Not 
I don't like what you wore. You know, I don't like, you know, what you said or, or I think, you know, you, you need to change this or that or I don't like how you organize it. I mean, these things, follow Matthew 18, take it to the pastor directly. If you're afraid, you know, talk to the supervising pastor. If you're afraid of him, talk to one of the deacons. You know, there, there's different ways you can, when, when it talks about a charge, this is a serious allegation like abuse or sexual immorality, or, or an unrepentant sin, right? If there's a serious charge or a crime, then you got to call the authorities. And if he does not listen to two or three credible witnesses, that's why you need two or three credible witnesses. It's not just your opinion, otherwise it's he said, she said. But if there is a credible charge against a pastor, the issue should be formally brought before the church in a corporate meeting. Now, the instructions in verse 19 are part of a pastor's protection, as I mentioned, not a pastor's punishment, and this is very important. Here's why you want to protect us. Yeah, I know, I know I'm a pastor. I'm, I, I love this passage. It's because rumors can kill us. You know that? If, if you accuse me of something, even if I'm proven innocent, it's over. And I know that, so I'm, I'm a little bit more careful. I follow our, our policies. Uh, I fellowship with a team of younger generation uh, lead pastors, and we all have different views. And they might think I'm a little too old school. I don't counsel women one-to-one. I will not take a counseling case. And so from an entire generation, they will say, you're one of those pastors that don't care for women, and you're blaming women for sexual immorality. No, women one-to-one can accuse you, right? On Sundays, I will talk to sisters. I'll pray for you. I encourage you. You all know that. But you don't see me constantly around the sisters. You know, you don't want to be accused of flirtation. I will not meet you at Starbucks one-to-one. I cannot. If there's a serious crisis, a sister, you come into the office, make an appointment during office hours. I make sure that my secretary is here and door stays at least half open. Because it's a crisis, we're going to minister to you. If it's a grandma, you know, that's a little different, right? Uh, I'm sorry, sisters, I cannot give you a ride home. Okay, I cannot give you a ride home. If it's an emergency, I call the Uber. If it's an emergency, you sit in the back, and I call my wife and put her on a speakerphone. The whole drive. And I will ask in certain meetings, can I record? You know, I will ask permission, everything, right? If, if there's an accusation brought again. I haven't found myself having a problem here. I know that other churches, they would look at me as um, an evil pastor. They would counsel me for not loving women. I love women. Uh, I, take that in the right context. Don't sound bite. Don't sound bite that. Don't sound bite. I love my sisters in Christ as a pastor, but everybody knows I'm a guy's pastor. You know, sports illustrations. All. I'd rather be counseled for saying Hanley primarily ministers to men, and he's not as sensitive. He doesn't understand us as well. I'd rather be counseled for that than to be that guy's flirtatious. Because in my earlier days, I was flirtatious. In my college days, in my younger days, right? And, and I was around the sisters all the time. And so I know myself, right? I have to be above reproach, okay? You know, and, and that's why Paul tells Timothy, pastors need to be above reproach because a rumor, even if it's a false rumor, will ruin you. Will ruin you. Literally. You, you can't recover from that. So that's why he's saying for a pastor's protection, don't omit a serious charge unless there's two or three witnesses and it's credible. But as for those who persist in sin, if there's really sin and they don't listen to you, and they're not listening to the deacons now, you've brought it to the deacons, you've brought it to the person, personnel committee, that's our, our human resources, you've brought it, like, like even the supervising pastors aren't listening to you, then someone has to bring it to the church. And this is talking about in a formal sense, in a corporate business meeting, our bylaws have a process where you have the right to do that. And when it says rebuke them in the presence of all, that's not saying you just go up and embarrass and dishonor someone, right? Again, this is talking about Matthew 18, that you have pastors who are clearly in sin. It's been investigated. It's proven. Two or three witnesses have done it. The deacons have done it. They're not listening. They're, they're, they're doubling down. Rebuke them in the presence of all. They're rounding up people. Rebuke them, meaning 
you do church discipline. Why? Just like in Matthew 18, so that the rest may stand in fear. Fear of what? Fear of God, that the church of Jesus Christ must uphold the holiness of Christ to the best of our ability. Again, pastors aren't going to be perfect. They're going to make mistakes. But there's a difference in, in being confronted to say, oh yeah, you know, I need to watch out for for what I say, or I need to watch out for my attitude, or, or was I not kind, could I be more gracious, versus unrepentant persistence in sin that's harming the reputation of Christ and the church. This is true. And so when it says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, this is putting, putting power behind. It's not just the, 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 the members of the church who have authority to discipline a pastor who's in sin, but it's in the presence of the divine courts and of Christ Jesus and the elect angels. All the angels who did not fall are are angels. You don't call them elect angels. So this is talking about angels given to a specific task, right? They've been given a specific task. And if you read this in context, these are angels who participate in judgment. They will come when Jesus returns and participate in the judgment of God. And so it's in the presence of, the, of these angels with the heavenly courts that don't prejudge, allow for investigation and everything, but do nothing from per- partiality. Now, we do have a problem with partiality. The bigger the celebrity, the bigger the platform, the more famous the pastor, more gifted the pastor, the more protection they're going to have. The more honor the pastor has bestowed. You see, that's the thing we told our pastors. We said, you can do a million things right. You do one thing that's a gross sin, you're done. So we need to watch our lives and our doctrine closely. But you, you see it, right? People are like, oh, the pastor has done a million good things, but uh, he did this one thing off. Let's just put him on administrative leave forever, or let's just, and quickly, like, like you know, you, you read about that stuff. This passage is saying, don't allow that to happen the members of the church, you take your responsibility. That's why membership matters. For me, membership matters because that puts accountability on me to raise up mature members. Because mature members will not bring up false accusations against a pastor and cancel them, but mature members will have the strength to discipline us. And I'm not a celebrity pastor. It's hard to discipline the celebrity pastors when they're the reason why the church has grown, right? In many, from, from an optics perspective, and so the elders sometimes put pressure, saying, basically, we discipline this guy, there goes our budget. This is show no partiality, right? If someone persists in sin, you need to deal with it. Now, here's, here's a question. Some of you, and I need a little more time today because this is really serious, okay? Some of you might say, well, what if, I can't confront a pastor for abuse. What if I'm too afraid? Because what if nobody believes me? You know, this pastor was, it was, was inappropriate towards me. No one's going to believe me. No one's going to believe me. Uh, you know, the deacons are not going to listen to me. They're going to think I'm a troublemaker. And in a, in a church like our context, how can I dishonor someone like a pastor? Well, that's why our church responded with many Southern Baptist churches by setting up a caring wall ministry. I don't know if you guys remember, a couple years back there was a Houston Chronicle article that was shocking, bombshell, that revealed within Southern Baptist churches how much, how much there was child abuse, sexual abuse, affairs, just tons of abuse, power abuse, stuff that was covered up, but crimes actually covered up and not reported. You have also, the reason why you need to bring people into public discipline is that And I'm going to say it in the Asian way. You sweep it under because you don't want to cause problems in the church. What happens is that pastor silently resigns. They go to another church. They do the same thing. Right? And and, and, and then there's there's just a list of, uh, I hate to use the word victims, but in this case when it's a crime, it's a crime. And so that article came out, it was a bombshell. So Southern Baptists had to respond. It's not just Southern Baptists. You see this in other denominations, in non-denomination churches as well. Right? Celebrity pastors, one after another, but even non-celebrity pastors, one after another, falling. And so we set up a caring well system aligned with the Southern Baptist ch- Church's training and their resources 
for reporting. So there's, uh, if there's suspected child, child abuse or elderly ap- uh, abuse, there's reporting. We have our, you know, screening, if you want to work with minors, all of that. And that's also aligned with some California state law. There's a process for rep- reporting suspected abuse from a church volunteer or a leader that's not paid. But when it comes to pastors, right, there's a formal process r- for reporting suspected abuse from a pastor or employee where you don't go and tell the pastor or employee. And so here's what it is. I, there was a flow chart that was sent to me on a PDF, and I kept trying for 15 minutes to copy the picture out to put it up, and I couldn't do it, so I just put it in bullet point. Okay, so here it is. But if you want the flow chart, um, talk to Pastor Terrence. He has a whole document for you, and you can get that from our office. If there is suspected abuse against any victim by a paid pastoral staff member, you step one is you talk to our English Caring Well team. There's a team. I forget who's on that team, except there's Doris Chin and um, Linda Chow, but there's, there's credible people, non-paid volunteers. And Pastor Terrence is the English, is the pastoral representative, and Pastor Chi Ho being a Chinese representative. But you can go to the front office and say, who is the English Caring Well team member? These are serious charges, especially sexual abuse or sexual harassment or anything like that, but also power abuse and things. You can bring it to the Caring Well team. You don't bring it to the pastors because, again, we want to make room for you to, to feel like in our church you can uh, bring up a serious charge. Secondly, there's a church-wide Caring Well team. All three congregations have their own Caring Well team of volunteers. And that Caring Well team, so between those two, step one and two, there's investigation. If needed, we will do the, in, the uh, hire, you know, our insurance, and we have in, investigate, uh, independent investigations if it's serious enough. Step three, it goes to the deacons, the personnel. Again, that's like our HR. These are all volunteers. Our committees, um, personnel committee, and our trustees. Uh, Trustees rotate, but they're actually responsible for the church. These are all volunteers. We're so thankful for all of them, including the care and well team. None of them are paid. And then legal authorities and organizations. At some point, obviously, the senior pastor, if he's not the one in question, is informed, the lead pastor is informed if it's one of our subordinates, but if it's us, that pastor is not part of it. Immediately, that pastor has to go on administrative leave, even if it's a false accusation, right? Um, But it's serious, so we have a process. Now, if it's not that serious of a concern, but you're concerned about anything, like, oh, our pastor doesn't sleep enough, you know, I think our pastor should get paid more, (laughs) no, our pastor, but whatever, please talk to our deacons. I'm joking about some things, but um, seriously, for me, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to, please, I trust our deacons. Our deacons, when they tell me something, I've learned to listen. I've always listened, but um, I've learned to listen. I don't see our deacons as adversary, you know. Um, We would not be alive if it were not for them uh, and how they help us. If you're afraid of me, talk to the deacons. Say, you know, Hanley, um, maybe he could do this a little better, or maybe, you know, he was kind of mean on the pulpit. Uh, Maybe he shouldn't talk about the Lakers so much. You know, those are serious charges, right, of like disqualification, but go tell uh, Deacon Gordon, and he'll tell you, well, we like it that he talks about the Lakers. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Yeah, but please go talk to our deacons, our English deacons. Know who they are, recognize them, and and if you're afraid, they will talk to us, right? So I get it. You know, Matthew 18, you should talk to us, but I understand the power dynamic, and, and we, we understand we don't want to abuse our power. So, if, so please talk to our deacons. For, uh, but if there's a serious concern, we need to know. And especially things that are legal, we need to deal with. We, that's why we have insurance. That's why we have to have all of this, okay? Um, but that's also why we have a sexual purity policy. Now, all of this information is available for any member. You go to the office and see, I want to see our Caring Well document. And on there, there's the sexual purity policy. And so that even backs me up. On there, it says I cannot drive a woman, you know, home by myself. It has all this. I, I cannot meet, you know, at Starbucks with one. It has all of this. You know, I cannot counsel a woman. It has all of that stuff on there. And so, uh, and it also for women to, you know, also nowadays with homosexuality, and everything, yes. So you get it. There's a lot of caveats. Um, that document is, is, is a deep document with flow charts and processes and everything. So I'm so thankful that our church uh, wants to submit to the Southern Baptist recommendation of Caring Well Ministries. Now back to Scripture. Okay, verse 20. 
As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that they may, they may stand in fear. Uh, and once again, persist in sin. I also see this as protection. Because we pastors sin. We're going to sin. Thank you for being gracious with us. Persistence in sin is not okay. And so please, when you examine the pastors, rather than just, it's hard, it's tough, right? Um, please give us grace, but please let us know if you see a pattern. Or let the deacon know if you see a pattern. Because a good pastor is going to say, that was a blind spot. Or maybe I was burned out and I was running on empty and not telling anyone. Thank you for showing me that and helping me grow, right? And preventing me from getting to a point where I would ever be disqualified, right? Persistence of sin refers to a lack of repentance. It's true. When you get to a certain position as a pastor, it's very easy just to think, I'm the pastor. Who are they to tell me? You know, because Satan wants to implant that type of pride within the hearts of his servants. If he can destroy the pastor, then he can destroy the church. So pastors need to surround themselves with accountability. I also think that's why there's a danger in the solo pastor. If you can afford to have a plurality of pastors, you should. Okay? The point here, once again, is there should be no cover-up of scandals. Now, um, we've explained verse 21 so careful examination and observation of one's character is the reason why Paul warns Timothy not to ordain too quickly, and we see that in point number three. So we see in point number two, there was the protection and the necessary correction of pastors who persist in sin, including church discipline and protecting other churches from a bad pastor going to that church and, and producing the same type of problem. Point number three is trustworthy ordination. Trustworthy ordination. Okay, this is verses 22 to 25. There's a reason why we have licensed ministers and then we have ordination, all right? Let's read verses 22 to 25. It says, do not be hasty. That means do not be quick in the laying out on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water. Some of you, this is your favorite verse, but uh, you know, you shouldn't be. But use a little wine, a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. The sins of some people are conspicuous. Going before them to judgment, it just means it's clear. But the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, meaning so also some people's good, good works are obvious uh, and even those that are not uh, cannot remain hidden. So this is basically saying not quick to ordain. Laying on of hands refers to publicly setting a man apart for the office of pastor. This is talking about ordination. Some denominations ordain their pastors. In Baptist churches, pastors are ordained by a local church. That means you, a local body of believers, affirms the ordination of pastors. Now, Paul warns Timothy, don't be hasty. Don't be quick and careless when ordaining men. You need to observe them, right? You need to observe them because he's saying that some people, their motives or their blind spots are hidden you, you see the giftedness at first. You see the charismatic personality. You see the leadership ability. But you don't see the character issues until later when it's too late and it comes out. So they need to be observed before you lay hands on them and ordain them. Now, I want to make it clear that ordination is not licensing. Uh, in our church and in many Baptist churches like ours, we have ministers who are licensed. You license them. The licensing uh, means they're recognized formally to perform the ordinances without being ordained. They can do the Lord's Supper. They can baptize. They can do weddings, and they can do funerals, and they can minister. We're licensed ministers. In, um, it's, a, it's a minister in training. It's ordination track, right? Directors are not on ordination track. Ministers are on track for ordination, if someone comes to us and they're already ordained, then we need to check references and make sure they're in good stand. That means they've been previously ordained uh, in their denomination or with their church. But when we hire someone who's yet to be ordained, we hire them as a minister first. If we raise up an intern ourselves and we raise up someone internally who gets called into ministry, first they become minister. Two to three years of observation, okay, and then 
uh, and then we, we ordain them. We give them, by the time we give them the application for ordination, it's because we've already affirmed that they're qualified to be ordained. But until they're ordained, some of you members, you know this, that every couple years in the business meeting, we have to vote to renew the license of our ministers, which means there's room for correction or for us to realize this person's yet ready, maturity-wise, to be ordained. So it's saying don't be quick, and that's why we have licensing. Licensing is not ordination. Ordination is ordination. Licensing needs to be renewed. Ordination is for life. Once you're ordained, that pastor, wherever they go, mission field, another church, their ordination through our church carries with them. And so, so look at these strong words. I'll come back to the alcohol passage in a moment. Okay, don't read too much into that, right? But verse 24, it says the sins of some people are conspicuous, right? Well, let me finish first, verse 22 first. In verse 22, it says, notice it says, don't, do not be hasty in the laying of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Notice there's the connection there. Keep yourself pure. Now, now these are good standalone commands, but the idea is Paul is, is connecting don't participate in, in sin, in other people's sins, and keep yourself pure with ordination. Meaning, if you're too hasty to ordain a person based on gifting, then you're held responsible for their sin and for their impurity. So first, this is to the elders, the pastors, and then to the congregation. Don't be too quick, right? Nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Now verse 23. Why? The reason for verse 22 is clear in verse 24. It's because, as I mentioned, the sins of some people are hidden I mean, are conspicuous, they're clear, meaning it's so clear. It goes before them to judgment, meaning you kind of see it, that they're headed towards judgment. They're unrepentant, it's obvious. But the sins of others appear later. You need time to observe that. But then it's positively saying some people, their character and their maturity is so good, they can't even hide it, even if they wanted to. Verse 25, so also good works are conspicuous. They're so clear, even those that are, are not cannot remain hidden. So you will see very clearly who's fit for the ministry and who's not with some simple observation. Now verse 23 is a personal note for Timothy. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach. So this tells us that Timothy has some health issues. My understanding is that wine creates GERD and acid reflux, so I don't know how that works. You know, um, but it's not saying, it's not giving him license to be a drunkard. It says, you know, it's okay to use a little bit of wine, right? And in our church, our practices is fine. Drinking is fine in moderation, even for our pastors. And so, you're, um, and, and so that's, that's it. That's there. Okay, so don't be quick to ordain. Now, the big idea this morning is that Jesus' church must uphold the trustworthy line between honoring their pastors and keeping them accountable. Jesus' church must uphold the trustworthy line between honoring their pastors. So honor their pastors, treat them well, compensate them fairly and well, make sure they're not suffering, make sure they're not, that they that provide counseling services available for them if they need, shepherd and take care of their families. At the same time, it's not, it's not treat them as celebrities, it's, it's protect them from false accusations and rumors, protect them also from their own sinfulness by correcting them in a loving and gracious way, set up processes and, and have people that, they can talk, that you can talk to, being sensitive of the power dynamic in the room that's happening. So it's a fine balance that must be upheld. This is gold for our churches and for pastors. In sum... Pastors are imperfect people who will disappoint you. Churches are full of imperfect members who will also let you down at one point or another. The key is not placing our faith in imperfect pastors, even good ones, or church members. Rather, our faith is in Christ. It's because of Christ that we can be open, honest, and humble in our shortcomings. Christ was worthy not just of double honor, but of eternal honor, yet he was rejected by many. Rather than being paid and compensated for his powerful ministry, he paid the price, the eternal price, to minister to you and me on the cross. Only he could do that. He was judged, accused, falsely accused of sins. He did not commit, innocent, yet instead of being protected like the church protects good pastors, nobody protected him. 
Nobody came to his defense. He remained silent like a lamb, led to slaughter. He did not defend himself against false accusations. Then on the cross, rather than being protected from God's judgment, he bore divine correction for you and me. As a result, we don't ordain Christ. Rather, we recognize him as King of kings and Lord of lords. Christ is our highest glory. You will hear on the news, and this will be my final, I promise I'll end. You will hear on the news over and over again of pastors disappointing you, Christian leaders being disqualified. That's just, we can't stop it. You will also hear on the news churches that are, you know, burning out pastors and pastors leave. You'll hear all of that. Do not let that shape your view of the true church or the true Lord and Savior. The church's quality and the church's validity does not stand or fall based on the performance of church members or church leaders, but it stands and fall on our perfect Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let him alone be the Savior. And because Christ loves his church and is not done with his church and is sanctifying his bride, the bride of Christ is going to be okay. The bride of Christ is going to be beautiful, even with all its blemishes. Do not lose hope on the church. Love the church because you love Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for such a clear passage of Scripture that offers instructions for how churches are to relate to their pastors and how pastors are to relate to their churches. Father, I pray that you would protect our church from scandal, that you would keep our, our pastors truly transparent and humble, challenge us, but we thank you, Lord, that so far you've been gracious to us. You've been gracious to us as pastors. You've been gracious to this church. You've given us faithful, kind-hearted, loving members that we don't deserve. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would continue to build this church upon your word, that we would not be afraid to apply the difficult but clear instructions of Scripture. Help us to truly uphold sola scriptura by surrendering and submitting to your word. Will your word rule us and not the pastors, nor the congregation? And will your word lead us? If there's anybody in here this morning who does not know Jesus, we pray, Lord, that you would save them. Save them, Lord, because you are their hope, no one else. And it's in your name, it's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for the overtime. Would you please rise and let's sing together the response songs, Yet Not I, But To Christ In Me. But the God grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless being. Together. Till this I hope, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is only bound to be. Oh, how strange and divine, and I say, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. His love is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need, His power is displayed. To disciples, to disciples, my shepherd will defend me. To the deepest valley He will lead. Oh, the night has been wild. And I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ is in me. With every breath, I 
I long to follow Jesus, for He has said that He will bring me home. And day by day, I know He will renew, until I stand with joy before the door. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. Thank you so much for the extra time. I promise not to abuse that uh, each week. Um, we do need your help to stack the chairs if you're physically able to, and if you're not a newcomer. If you're a newcomer visitor, please don't feel obligated to help in the stacking of chairs. Uh, please receive the benediction, and we pray that you have a blessed Sunday. All right? May the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the power and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in God's peace. Amen.